there is one more person in the waiting room so Maybe I try so to. We will join. I think in our. Yeah, yeah, no. So there is one person in waiting room, or is it all joined already? Okay, fine. So let me start. Then uh, welcome everyone. So uh, uh, this is uh, uh, going to be a very uh, brief sketch, an overview of uh, solar physics. Sketch because in a single lecture uh, it's uh, nearly impossible to cover uh, broad aspects that solar physics uh, covers. It, as you know, involves a whole range of topics with uh, various players that actually even impact our uh, life on uh, Earth. So I hope uh, the screens are uh, visible to you. Uh, but I'll just uh, straight away give you some uh, references. Uh, in case uh, you want to go in more detail in some of the thoughts and uh, topics that you like. Uh, so, for example, this uh, by now fairly old book uh, by Michael Sticks on the sun is a very good uh, read on uh, solar physics. Then there is a very interesting uh, uh, book on sun's influence on climate by Hagen Kagel. There is a very old book on uh, stellar structure because, of course, Sun uh, is a star and it has particular structure and supports certain dynamics, waves, magnetic fields, all these. So, uh, how uh, the stars reach the structure that they have, uh, for that, uh, I can refer to uh, this book uh, by Cox and Hewley. Uh, more modern updates based on helioseismology. Basically, the technique which allows us to look underneath the photosphere, otherwise sun is opaque, right? So, the only way we can infer the internal structure is by uh, way of uh, uh, helioseismology. And uh, that is very well covered in this uh, review by uh, Christian Sindhaskar. Uh, there are even... Uh, uh, given that the whole topic of convection, which is transporting energy in the upper layers of the sun, is a, has become very controversial in the recent time. So, uh, for a good review of uh, that, uh, I can refer to uh, Schumacher and uh, Srinivasan. Among many other references that you can find, either cited in these uh, references or uh, then you can uh, look up depending on your interest. So, let's start with the uh, where the sun lies in the so-called uh, main sequence. It's a main sequence star. And uh, I believe you must have uh, uh, been uh, told about the HR diagram in astronomy, in productive astronomy and astrophysics course. Uh, if not, then uh, you could look up and uh, go through. It's a very fairly uh, straightforward, tight relation between luminosity and surface temperature of the star. Uh, relevant for the talk here is just this single line here where uh, all the uh, main sequences star basically line up along this ridge. And sun lies exactly here, which is actually a G2 type star. Its uh, magnitude is about 5. That's why we can uh, see this with the naked eye. So it's, uh, of course, the most bright object in the sky. And uh, this gives you a sense of its uh, luminosity and temperature and uh, stuff like that. And, uh, and it's a spectral type. A very brief uh, uh, scenario on how the stars, um, including, uh, for example, the sun, even form in the galaxies is covered here. It involves a whole uh, range of topics. So I can only uh, give you keywords uh, which you could uh, look up. But I can give you a very brief scenario that you can uh, imagine that this is uh, an interstellar medium um, in the galaxy, spiral galaxy, the Milky Way in this case. And in the beginning, of course, there is no star. There is a, uh, essentially a disk has formed, suppose. 
and uh, it's a baryonic disk in a more sphericalized uh, dark matter potential well yeah this is a very large dark matter dark matter potential well inside which these galaxies uh, exist and uh, if uh, the evolution is large enough like these late type galaxies uh, one tends to uh, uh, see that uh, these spiral galaxies form as a result of secular evolution of galaxy so it's a galaxy formation physics but once you have formed them we know from the early universe and cosmology that the uh, the main uh, element in the baryonic uh, universe is essentially hydrogen right so one could uh, to zero order imagine that all of this so called galactic disk is uh, made of uh, hydrogen atom basically these are the hydrogen atoms it's a very tenuous uh, uh, medium very very small density let's say uh, uh, 10 to the minus uh, 20 kg per cc or very very small densities yeah uh, much uh, smaller than the densities we typically encounter on, in our uh, uh, terrestrial settings or even solar uh, densities are much larger so this is a very thin nearly a vacuum uh, like uh, state the interstellar medium and it so happens that part of this uh, interstellar medium before the stars are born part of this stellar medium uh, interstellar medium uh, begins to collapse uh, there is a criteria and you might have uh, been told about the jeans criteria or jeans instability that governs this collapse basically uh, if the perturbation in the interstellar medium occurs over length scale which is very large so of course the density is very small but if i go to a very large distances or take a very large size then the mass contained in that very large nebula or very large part of the or piece of the ism the mass content of that very large volume can actually then become very large and then you can imagine that if i keep going to larger and larger length scale within the galaxy within ism it may so happen that the mass contained in that volume may actually collapse under its own gravity right the gravitational attraction is of course there and uh, you can uh, even ask the question why uh, the uh, molecules in our room don't collapse yeah. and uh, so things like these uh, what is it that doesn't uh, that doesn't support this collapse in for example uh, for molecules in uh, room temperature Yeah, and you will find that the thermal velocities and the pressure in the room is large enough to counter the gravity okay but here in this case uh, if the mass is indeed very large then the gravity the associated gravitational potential well uh, can be very deep and the uh, collapse could occur the criteria is such that there is a, a wave number or wavelength lambda j jeans length lambda is defined which you can work out depends basically on the square root of rho in the denominator okay so if the density is very very large sorry very very small as is the case with ism the length scale that you must go to should be very very large okay. so the collapse occurs for length scales that are larger than the lambda j or in other words in that length scale given a density rho you can work out how much is the mass content that also goes as 1 over square root of rho okay so for a very low dense medium low density medium the jeans mass can be very high and therefore the initial collapse collapsing large cloud large is to be highlighted will be very very large it happens that the stars form in an environment basically um, it's never like uh, it's hardly ever that the one single star is forming it's a very large collapsing cloud as the cloud is now collapsing under its own uh, gravity uh, the density in the local cloud or the you call it nebula for example uh, this uh, picture here the density of this nebula i hope you can uh, see my cursor is uh, getting larger and larger the density is increasing as a function of time as the collapse happens proceeds density larger compared to the rest of the ism okay now you can see that as the density increases the requirement on the jeans criteria gets more and more favorable 
for smaller masses and objects to collapse. So what happens that a very large collapsing cloud, once the density uh, has increased uh, sufficiently, it begins to fragment because it's a very large cloud and there may be local instabilities uh, within the cloud. And you'll find that there will be large number of uh, such uh, subsystem within this uh, nebula. Each of those subsystems are eventually going to give you a solar system or stellar systems. So whole bunch of stars are basically forming from this uh, initially collapsing very large cloud. Okay. So I hope this is clear that you start from galaxy, you uh, let it evolve, then there is a disk, and then there is an ISM, primarily hydrogen. But there is, of course, given that Milky Way is kind of late type galaxy, uh, there are even other elements that play a major role. So um, the physics of cooling, basically, that uh, you can uh, really uh, form smaller mass objects. It's actually possible only when you allow for a cooling uh, through uh, molecular emission lines okay, so that the object can further uh, uh, contract and whatever is the temperature rise that uh, can essentially be lost due to radiation and the collapse can proceed further and further for even smaller mass. So if you have a lot of metals in the ISM, then you can actually form smaller stars like the sun. In very early universe, um, you might have heard of population three stars, which are actually very massive, like 100 solar mass stars, yeah? because the uh, presence of metal is very, very, it's not metal rich. Okay. So a lot of things here. But I hope the point is clear that you can form the fragments and then that will give you uh, something like uh, pre-solar nebula. Okay. Now you must have also uh, heard of Virial theorem. I'm not writing anything, but that basically two times the average kinetic energy plus the average gravitational energy equals zero in a, for a virialized object. That simply means that as the collapse occurs, there will be a random motions of the constituent particles, in this case, say hydrogen or helium. And uh, this virialized object will then become heated because the microphysics of temperature is basically like random motion. So, uh, so because the object, while it's collapsing, is also getting hotter and hotter, there will be a time when the temperature, or in other words, the pressure in that collapsed object can be high enough to support the further collapse under gravity. Okay. So the pressure can support against gravity and that is how the protostar is formed. Okay. Now this is still, now you can visualize as a more spherical like small star within the cloud. There may be multiple stars that are forming in this large cloud and um, this is still not the so-called zero is main uh, sequence star because this is still pressure supported. What happens is that while uh, uh, much of the outer envelope may uh, be still collapsing and be pressure supported, the core of that uh, uh, so-called protostar may actually have a temperature which is very, very large, say 10 to the 6 or larger Kelvin, in which case the nuclei or the uh, uh, as you can see that uh, the energies, the thermal energies are perhaps in the order of MeV range, a kilo electron volt range, and the uh, ionization potential for hydrogen atom is only 13.6 electron volt. So you can imagine that hydrogen is no more in a neutral state, but it's a plasma state. Okay. So electron is kicked out, and now you are compacting it further and further. So nuclei have come, uh, or these uh, hydrogen ions have come very close to each other. And now the quantum effects can arise, or that they do arise, that if two nuclei, or if these two uh, nucleus are held very close to each other for a very long time, of course there is a Coulomb barrier to cross, but then you know that the quantum tunneling would take place and the fusion may start. Okay. So, that is when the star enters into a zero age main sequence phase. That is where it actually comes on this main sequence branch of the HR diagram. So I hope this whole uh, broad picture right from the fragmentation uh, galaxy uh, and everything is clear. In the 
uh, core, therefore, the hydrogen starts to fuse to form helium. We know that the binding energy per nucleon for helium is much larger than the hydrogen, and therefore, uh, there will be uh, energy release in the process of fusion. Okay, what you call exothermic reactions. So, if uh, any of this is not clear, please go back to your um, some very basic nuclear physics or just uh, look up uh, what is this proton proton chain uh, reaction that is the main dominant chain for nuclear fusion to occur in case of the sun. And uh, there is a very tiny uh, uh, fusion uh, that takes place uh, due to so called CNO cycle, but the dominant one is PPG. Okay. Now you start to form uh, burn hydrogen, start to make helium, and as a result, there is an energy which is produced. Okay. Now the core, let me see what I have here, but uh, uh, I think I'll just uh, slowly, or maybe it was very slow actually. Okay, so I hope it is clear that a proto star and then uh, eventually a zero S main sequence sun is now formed as a result of nuclear burning of hydrogen in the core. It's not burning everywhere, it's also true because uh, the density and temperature is increasing as you go towards the core. In outer layers, the densities are perhaps not that big, temperature also not that large, so that the Coulomb barrier is not uh, possible to cross the Coulomb barrier between the, the two protons when they come because after all they will uh, repel each other, right? These are both positive charges that are ultimately uh, fusing. So, so the burning starts in the core. When you look at the sun um, uh, by a naked eye, you roughly see a, a uniformly illuminated, nearly uniformly illuminated disk. You might also notice some dark features. We don't know what they are. We perhaps still don't know uh, uh, why they form. But we know that these are the sunspots, the regions of intense magnetic fields, but that I will come to later if there is time. Uh, so, uh, this looks a bit boring if you look at uh, in a visible light uh, to naked eye. Now, uh, if you go uh, use a telescope uh, and observe the same sun in UV, you find uh, uh, very interesting structures. Right? There are these loops, there are these uh, open field lines. Yeah, there are these loop structures, open field lines and whatnot. So it's a very interesting uh, structure that you uh, find as you start to see sun in different wavelengths. Okay. These are, uh, as you uh, know, as we know by now, is that these uh, tend to be a proxy for the magnetic fields in the solar atmosphere. Of course, the magnetic field now it immediately uh, leads to a whole new physics here. That's why the solar physics that where do these magnetic fields form? I'll come to that in a moment. So one must immediately wonder, after all, this is a plasma. Plasma has resistivity. If the initial interstellar medium to begin with had some magnetic field from which the sun was formed and possessed that magnetic field. Now we also know the age of the sun, which is say 4.6 billion years. For that long time of the sun, lifetime of the sun, any magnetic field that was present to begin with in the initial phase, it should have decayed, just like uh, the currents dissipate due to resistance in wire. Right? So similarly, the, uh, one can work out that the ohmic decay time, um, uh, that it can uh, decay due to also because the sun is high Reynolds number and highly turbulent system. So it can actually lead to a decay in time much shorter in the lifetime of the sun, but we routinely observe magnetic fields in terms of these dark features and whatnot. So the natural question here is what generates the magnetic field and what supports it? It's interesting to then go to observe sun in multi-wavelength. You look at in X-ray, you look at in UV, visible, uh, you see these dark features. It, these are the most actually interesting objects uh, for me. Uh, then there is this infrared and radio. So there is a whole uh, variety of images that one can produce by choosing different wavelengths for your observations. Okay, And sun looks very structured, very interesting, very dynamic. It's an extremely dynamic sun. It's not a, it's never a boring uh, uh, 
that it appears uh, there is always something happening here. It's an extremely dynamic structure. It's just a snapshot that is shown. And nowadays, uh, on YouTube and stuff, you can find uh, tons of videos uh, to show you structures, evolutions from seconds or nanoseconds time, school, time scales to years of time scales. So all the time scales are covered, all the length scales are covered. So it's a large spectrum problem. So such problems tend to be very complex. So sun is a complex one. Some of the properties to note that uh, by now we know that radius of the sun. So these are just the numbers that you can look up. I'm not uh, list, uh, going for each of these, but look, just look at, for example, the average density. Average density. Density has a profile which I'll come to, but average density is already 10 to 3 kilograms per meter, which is much, much larger than a typical density of ISM. So from a very low density to a very high density, it has evolved. The luminosity is also very large. You see that it's uh, roughly uh, 10 to the uh, 26 watts. Effective temperature, because of which it acquires this color of uh, yellowish uh, color that we see. It's about, around, say, 6,000 Kelvin. And uh, nearly you can uh, fit a black body to it. And uh, the peak of the black body will uh, fall in the visible range. And that's what we observe uh, in terms of the sun. The astronomical unit is uh, 4 to 10 to the 11 meter. Age of the sun is 4.6 10 to the 9 meters. One must wonder, if one is uh, just beginning uh, the subject, one must wonder how do we get these numbers? Where do these uh, numbers actually come from? So uh, this is an interesting thing. And in single lecture, it is not at all possible to even uh, tell you even the two of these numbers, how do these come from? <laughs> So, for example, you one can start from measuring the distance to the Earth, the solar uh, Sun-Earth distance. One can start from there. So that's going to be very useful. So, if we uh, somehow know, there are uh, processes called uh, uh, radar echoes. Yeah? You shine light uh, and then uh, look at the reflected light. You know the speed of light and you can measure the time uh, that it took for light to come back. You uh, can bounce the light from a planet. You can uh, try to determine the orbit of the planet and whatnot. You can do uh, many things and eventually can fit an orbit that it's a, a planet like Venus is in elliptic orbit. A planet like Earth is also expected to be in elliptic orbit. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that to derive these numbers, you rely on fundamental physics. So there is no um, escape. You do rely on fundamental physics because ultimately then you start that uh, this is a Kepler's laws must be obeyed, stuff like that. If I give you a semi-major axis, you can uh, uh, infer from that the time period. So you can uh, keep going, make uh, use of uh, the basic laws, conservation laws like mass conservation, energy conservation, and, and that kind of thing. How much uh, energy will be released per nucleon in the fusion process? This is all basic. I mean, if I um, have uh, four protons to fuse to make a uh, helium atom, uh, the energy release turns out to be 6 MeV per nucleon. It's large energy. It's actually a uh, very large energy. So stuff like that. So you know that how much uh, uh, fusion is taking place. We know in the uh, initial stage what was the helium abundance because helium abundance roughly matches with the helium abundance of the early universe. Not all of the matter is in hydrogen state, but uh, around 25% of the uh, by weight is in helium. So things like that. But if I suppose ask you, um, how do you determine the luminosity uh, of the sun? How do we get this number? So I'm simply uh, pointing these things to you that uh, if you are interested, uh, please uh, uh, yeah, work enough to get to these numbers. And this is not hard to derive, is what I can do. It's very easy, actually. Given that you are aware of all the physical laws. One example I could give is that there is a quantity that is routinely measured called solar irradiance. It's an important quantity because it is also the quantity that governs the or regulates the temperature on the Earth. Nowadays, we are so concerned about the global warming and whatnot. Uh, Basically, the Earth has its own temperature because of uh, how much energy or radiation 
is uh, basically uh, received by the earth as a function of time. This is plotted, but I just showed you that sun is emitting in all sorts of wavelengths. So at a given time, there is a whole spectrum of energy. Right? You integrate in lambda, you integrate in wave number or uh, new frequency, whichever you like, to come up with a single number, integrated solar irradiance basically at a given time. But then you plot as a function of time. You see that there are systematic variations, not very much, 0.25 uh, uh, watts per meter square. This is a peak to peak variation. But this is enough actually this, uh, uh, to actually make a significant impact on the uh, terrestrial temperatures. And if, uh, in fact, for more, uh, you just look up uh, these uh, references. Uh, we know that the sun has this uh, sunspot cycle. You must have uh, heard of this before. But uh, I will talk somewhat differently about the sunspots later. But assuming that you know that the sunspots come and go and they have a maximum and then they, there is a minimum phase. Right now, for example, sun is in the rising phase. The number of sunspots are increasing as a function of time. We just have come out of the minima. So given all that, there is a cyclic oscillations between the sunspot number and the irradiance correlates positively with the sunspot number. So that is one. There are even daily variations on minute scale variation, all that. And solar irradiance is basically the energy that is received by the Earth. Okay, now, that is also a little, uh, uh, it requires care to uh, visualize. We know that sun is emitting in from, say, uh, radio to gamma rays. Right? Not all of that actually reaches the Earth surface. It reaches the Earth, of course, but not all of that reaches the surface of the Earth. So these are basically the typical largest or typical mountains heights. So from the uh, sea level, which is here, okay, even if you take the Mount Everest, which is say uh, here, so Mount Everest will come somewhere here. And uh, we are typically uh, near the sea level. So our height is somewhere here. If you are uh, able to see my cursor, uh, this cursor uh, is roughly displaying the height uh, where we live yeah, near to the sea level, close to Bombay, say. So at the sea level, you can imagine, near Bombay. And if you go higher up in the altitude, you see that it's only the visible light here, uh, which is shown in uh, this uh, yellow, green, violet and stuff. This reaches all the way, penetrates all the way to the Earth's surface. Whereas if you look at the X-rays and gamma rays, which are harmful rays, that are already truncated in the upper atmosphere of the Earth, okay, because of other atmospheric theory, which I will not get into. So, interested, go look up. So, uh, radio reaches us. Infrared, there is uh, uh, this profile that infrared also blocked. U is uh, also blocked to some extent. X-rays are blocked. Gamma rays are blocked. And in order to measure a quantity like a radiance, you must integrate over all the wavelengths because after all Earth's atmosphere, which is what is also regulating and controlling the temperature in our room, you must be able to integrate this entire light at any given time and come up with a number called solar irradiance, which is basically solar luminosity. Yeah? If uh, distance from the sun to Earth is roughly given by distance Earth sun square, so the irradiance is defined by luminosity, which has a unit of watts. And this is the length scale, so watts per meter square. So that's the unit here for solar irradiance. Once you have determined the irradiance, <coughs> and the distance, irradiance is an observable quantity. Directly, the solar luminosity is not. Irradiance is an observed quantity. Distance, you can estimate as I said, from radar eco techniques and whatnot, sun to earth distance is with basically one astronomical unit. I could have written one AU here. If this is known, this is measured, you can use this formula to determine the intrinsic luminosity of the sun. This is what is done. And that gives you the number which is quoted here. Once I know the intrinsic luminosity of the sun, I need to know, I must know beforehand the radius of the sun. Now, radius of the sun is a little tricky to measure compared to, for example, the mass of the sun. Mass of the sun is easier to measure 
the radius of the sun is much harder to measure. Okay, I'll also, if time permits, we'll come to helioseismology, uh, where I can give you a rough pointer how to measure the solar radius by simply looking at oscillations of the sun. Sun is, after all, a plasma ball. And just like any football ball, which will have a natural modes of oscillation, just like tabla or guitar, sun also is mostly like a musical instrument, which is oscillating with its fundamental frequencies. By measuring those frequencies, one can constrain the solar radius. There are other ways to measure solar radius also, of course. So you look up how to measure the solar radius. And uh, once you know the solar radius, luminosities uh, uh, and have inferred the luminosity through irradiance measurements, we know that the uh, Stephen Boltzmann's law you can apply, sigma t to the 4 multiplied to 4 pi radius of the sun square. I'm not writing a formula, but you can uh, pretty much see that 4 pi r sun square times the luminosity uh, times the uh, Stephen Boltzmann uh, sigma t to the 4 yeah, will give you the luminosity. Luminosity on the right hand side is known. So from this formula, having known the radius of the sun, you can infer the effective temperature of the sun. That's just an example. How do you measure the average density and stuff? So look up and uh, most likely uh, you'll find that this is not very difficult. You have to apply all sorts of uh, mass conservation, momentum conservation and energy conservation. Right? How much energy is produced in the, as a result of nuclear burning, all of that energy is passing through the surface. So you can uh, draw something like a Gaussian surfaces and let the same amount of energy pass through all the layers because the energy is conserved. So you apply the energy conservation. That will also give you, uh, and also the star, once you form the star, it is not collapsing anymore, right? So the star is now like in a static equilibrium. So then from the momentum equation, you can work out a hydrostatic equilibrium of the star, which will give you a pressure profile. How should the pressure vary from uh, the core to the radius? That can be determined. Use ideal equation of gas, and then you can work out uh, your uh, temperature, density, how they must vary. And later on, can verify based on helioseismology whether those inferences are right or not. But I can give you the answer. Sun is more like an adiab nearly adiabatically stratified uh, uh, system in the outer layers. It's a very nearly isothermal uh, core. By having an isothermal core, the problem is as soon as you have produced a photon by nuclear burning, and you can uh, go back and think about it, if you have produced a photon as a result of nuclear burning in an environment where the temperature is the same, that photon cannot really escape because as soon as the photon is born, it is reabsorbed in the same system. Okay, so you think about it. So it takes a very long time, about maybe 10 to the seven years for a photon to go from the core to somewhat outer uh, distance within the sun. So it's a very tedious journey for a photon to actually come. So only when there are temperature gradients, which are also natural because the uh, density is uh, stratified, it's density stratified system, Hydrogen helium abundances are also stratified. So, because of such stratifications, the radiation slowly diffuses outward. Okay. But uh, otherwise, you know that in a perfectly uh, black body at a single, single temperature wrapped in a adiabatic uh, type enclosure, yeah, radiation may not be able to escape. Okay. So, it, it's a very tedious journey of a photon from the core to the surface of the sun. That itself takes a long, long time, very long time. You can also work out that number. So, our current knowledge, this is again a sketch, is that the sun in its hydrostatic equilibrium, ignoring magnetic field and the rotation of the sun. Sun is rotating, of course, but it's very weakly rotating. Star. It's not a, a very fast rotator. In fact, in the HR diagram, the stars here are slowly rotating, stars here are fast rotators. So, uh, there is a radiative uh, core, okay. So, it's a radiation zone because the energy is transported by radiation. 
whatever energy is uh, being produced is being transported by radiation mercury you know that there are processes like radiation conduction convection these are the three channels of radiation transport here this is radiatively going outward the radiation that we see here the, on the earth at some point because the density and temperature both are dropping as a function of radius of the sun at some point you find the abundance of h minus Uh, at ions okay. and the h minus opacity of the sun increases exactly at this so called transition layer between the radiative core and convective envelope so these so called late type stars like the sun they tend to have an envelope outer envelope which is convectively unstable and here i am assuming that you have uh, learned about convection uh, namely the schwarzschild criterion of convection so outer layer of the sun is convectively unstable so that means that the energy is no more transported by radiation because radiation is locked to the matter and it is just like you are boiling your uh, tea pot uh, the matter which is heated up it uh, rises above and uh, cools down as it rises up and dumps the energy near the surface once it cools down it becomes heavier and falls back so this entire cycle continues and these are large overturning motions of convection exactly as you see in your uh, teapot okay now the energy is transported by convection so total flux is basically radiative flux plus the convective flux conduction is very weak here so there is core radiation zone convection zone above the convection zone we can actually also measure the surface gravity of the star which controls the atmospheric physics very much what is the surface gravity of the so if you know the mass if you know the radius of the sun then the surface gravity gravitational acceleration basically is equal to uh, square root gm by r square right so that's your uh, uh, ah sorry what is this square root gm by r square yeah Yeah, not square root. G is G M by R square. So small G is capital G M by R square. So you can determine the surface gravity. That turns out to be two hundred and seventy-four meters per second square. Okay. Above the sun, there is a chromosphere, and then much above there is a coronal corona. Okay. Corona is called because it's much hotter now. Sun. Uh, so we'll uh, come to that uh, in a moment. But let's first look at from the solar center. to solar radius normalized uh, basically radius to the solar radius one is uh, the surface of the sun this is the center of the sun these two curves for example this is the luminosity of the sun in the solar unit so nearly all of the luminosity that we see is uh, produced out of uh, burning in a very short core here point 2 see it has reached the level 1 already here much uh, Okay, so no energy, no more energy production uh, in the outer layer. Okay, it's only tra being transported here, but not being produced. So that's the intrinsic luminosity. The mass, as you see, that as you go to outer and outer layers, your mass is expected to just rise, right? Because you are now adding more and more shells to your uh, inner core, so mass increases like that. This is good to know that. most of the solar mass is actually contained within the radiative core this is all the radiative core exactly between 0.7 to 1 this is uh, basically 200 megameter in the physical units because the sun has a radius of nearly 700 megameter out of 30% so 30% of 700 megameter is roughly say uh, 200 megameter roughly so from here to here it's 700 megameter here to here is roughly 200 megameter the mass content there is not so so much yeah, why because the density is uh, very steeply falling so that's the profile of the density highest in the center and the values for the density are given here so this uh, basically uh, if you are starting from here then this is 10 to the 5 kg per meter cube and similarly the temperature there at the center this is the temperature profile is roughly 10 to the 7 kelvin okay and the temperature at the surface is 10 to the 4 like uh, say 
5,000 Kelvin. So on, on the order of 10,000 Kelvin, basically. So that's the temperature profile, density profile inside the sun. How does it look outside the sun? So now this is the solar atmosphere. Okay. So as you see that there is a whole mix of, a uh, whole range of physics, and uh, there is no way uh, we can uh, uh, cover anything in detail. So I'll just uh, sketch what all is going on, and uh, it's up to you to uh, work out and uh, see how you get these profiles. Roughly, I've told you obey the mass conservation laws, momentum conservation laws, energy conservation laws, for a hydrostatic equilibrium of the star, if you work out, you'll get most of these numbers. Okay, and then uh, eventually uh, you look up uh, polytropic uh, equations and uh, so-called lane empty equations. So that is also good for your inter complete uh, understanding of hydrostatic uh, collapsed objects. Okay, not just for sun, but for other stars. Logic remains the same for other stars. Temperature. You're starting from say 10,000 uh, Kelvin at the surface. Surface, as you see, is a little bit uh, deeper inside. Zero is here, where 5,000 is. It's a log scale. First, the temperature decreases, 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 but at around 2,000 kilometer, you see, and this region, about from zero to 2,000 kilometer above the sun, this is called chromosphere. Okay. Temperature is solid, density as you see, density is just falling, falling, and then there is a sharp drop in density and very sharp corresponding jump in temperature. Okay. This is basically uh, uh, obvious that if the density drops very uh, quickly, there must be a corresponding uh, uh, jump in uh, temperature. Yeah. That also you can uh, think from basic thermodynamics. Okay. So any uh, sharp drop in density must always be associated with uh, sharp jump and uh, pressure remains continuous. So if you are drawing uh, pressure here, pressure remains a continuous function. So there is no jump in the pressure, so it just maintain pressure. So you think of uh, from the uh, ideal equation of the state and then uh, it's easy to uh, understand why a drop and rise here should be at the same height here. and the puzzle, which is a modern puzzle, it's an unsolved problem. So as I said uh, before that I'll uh, leave you with many bunch of unsolved problems. How come the sun, which we see at 5,000 Kelvin, 6,000 Kelvin, has within about 2,000 kilometer, a corona, which is a million degree hot. So the temperature here is nearly 1 million. So a million degree hot corona above the sun's surface Corona, we don't see from our naked eye, but as I showed in X-rays and all, it's very bright. So you do, from other telescopes, you routinely discover Corona. There are very interesting, nice images of uh, the coronal loops. And one tries to connect the coronal heating problem, which is an open problem today, to these uh, so-called magnetic structures. As you can see that this is the solar surface. Yeah, This is the section of the solar surface. And these are the uh, magnetic field structures. These are the bipolar uh, magnetic field structures. Of course, as you know that the dive is, is always zero from Maxwell's equation. So uh, you have to obey all that. These are closed field line structures, which are called coronal loops. And one imagines that some foot point motions from the granules, because convection leads to a granular pattern on the surface of the sun. They basically move these uh, field lines. And these field lines, if there's a lot of magnetic field, they can reconnect. And that dissipate, they can dissipate in the atmosphere, local atmosphere, which is corona here. And that dissipation can actually lead to heating the corona. It's a speculative idea. I'm just uh, connecting uh, a few things that uh, physics involves magnetic fields. And how exactly that physics of magnetic field leads to the heating of corona is an unsolved problem. But typically, common understanding is that it must somehow be related to the uh, magnetic fields. So this is a coronal heating problem. So I think I've uh, told you uh, the internal structure, the outer structure, and a little bit of uh, connection with the magnetic field. There is another uh, puzzle that the sun does not rotate like a uniform body. Okay? Sun rotates differentially. What does it mean? So there is this, uh, uh, actually you can uh, look up a uh, paper by uh, Jesper show 1998 uh, if you can uh, see the equator 
This is the sun solar radius, and these are the measurements from heliocytes model. Okay, so these are observations and uh, not the models. These are the observations. This is the solar surface. Best to look at only the solar surface, which is this line here. Here is the solar surface. Forget about the interior. And this is the equator of the sun. This is going towards the pole of the sun. This is the rotation rate. Red means fast rotation. Bluish uh, darker color means slow rotation. So this plot immediately told that the sun rotates differentially with equator rotating at a fastest rate and the poles are the slower. Okay. So, and it is true only in the outer layers. Outer layer meaning only in the convection zone. So as you can see that most interesting things, including the magnetic field that I'll come to if I hope sometime I don't have, I don't think I have time, uh, but uh, the convection occurs only in this uh, outer 30% layer, 0.7 to 1, okay, outer 30% layer. All such interesting phenomena occur due to convection. So, convection plays a most vital role in the dynamics, internal dynamics and also the outer in, the, in, the, in some sense for the, the sun. So one of the key ingredients or the key physics of the solar physics, in my opinion, is convection. And uh, among many other things, convection is also an unsolved problem. The very basic hydrodynamic convection is something that we do not know. <laughs> but uh, there are some uh, pointers and uh, if you look up those books, you will find that uh, Schwarzschild criterion is invoked. And uh, there are uh, theories like uh, mixing length theory, you must have heard. Mixing length theory tries to explain the convection in stars, including the sun. But we also know that it's an uh, incomplete picture, and we are not able to predict from those theories the uh, somewhat latest uh, observations. Nevertheless, this is very interesting that there is a shear. Question is what produces and maintains the shear? Hint is role of convection and rotation. Sun is, of course, a all slowly rotating body. So, convection coupled with rotation can lead to a transport of angular momentum. And such a redistribution of angular momentum could give you a differential rotation which looks like this and such an effect is known as lambda effect in the literature. Okay? It is a purely turbulent effect. So, purely because of turbulence and redistribution of angular momentum, one could indeed generate shear and maintain it. Okay? Otherwise, it is a very uh, important, just like the magnetic field. They should decay. Why should shear be there? Okay. Shear should also have decayed. Something is maintaining, and the major player there is uh, convection. Now let's look at uh, where the story of magnetic field started. The earliest uh, example, the first magnetic field outside the Earth was discovered on the Sun. That is the first evidence of cosmic magnetic field. The solar magnetic field is the first evidence of cosmic magnetic field. Back in 1630, uh, these are uh, hand-drawn uh, drawings by the way. These are not photographs. This is 1630. These are sketches from pencil. And if you uh, zoom in and try to uh, look up, this has all com been compiled and come up in this book called Rosa Urzina. This is a, pen, a sketch by a person called Christoph Scheiner, who was a contemporary of Galileo. And they both uh, basically uh, fought all their lives. Okay. Very interesting uh, controversies of uh, Shiner and Galileo, uh, if you are interested, uh, read up. So, uh, if you look up in detail how these uh, individual dark objects were sketched and you look at a very modern, this is a Swedish solar telescope 2003 image of a sunspot, there is a dark umbra and then this filamentary penumbra and then these small little features are exactly the convective granules, that is where we have a direct uh, uh, yeah, picture of convection occurring at the solar surface. Mm -hmm. So, this is a convective gran granules. Mm -hmm. But look at the details, and details match pretty well. So, these are very beautiful drawings, by the way. Just by drawing them for 30, 40 years, because these guys have actually uh, made these kind of sketches for 30, 40 years, okay? painstakingly uh, looking at the sun and uh, just uh, making a drawing of the sun of the day. And that already gave the first hint of differential rotation of the sun 
because the dark spots close to the equator they were moving faster the dark spots that were away from the equator they were moving slower and that was the first evidence of uh, differential rotation already back in 1630s okay but these dark features were not identified as a magnetic fields or magnetic features these were first identified as magnetic features only after hale discovered the zeeman splitting on those uh, features exactly like this so you must have uh, learned of uh, zeeman splitting and this is uh, the uh, basically uh, observation from a sunspot where the uh, spectral line is split into these three the separation between the spectral line or the splitting Uh, gives you the strength of the magnetic field so these are kilo gauss type field strength is large i have only written 1 to 2 uh, but that's not true it's actually it can be very large i don't know what happened to uh, you see anyway this is uh, some repetition the structure of the sun and if you look at the magnetogram of the sun that means white and black represent white means the magnetic field come radially towards you black radially goes inward to the sun so these are bipolar magnetic fields that are appear on the solar surface and they they are very large in number at some epoch and as time proceeds the sun becomes magnetically quiet then the activity comes back so this entire thing is known as 11 year cycle of the sun spot okay. so it's very magnetically active very cyclic and and it does control our space weather i hope i can uh, go for a little long maybe i have to skip this so how do we understand that these are the magnetic fields how do we understand uh, the generation of these magnetic fields because that is what is controlling a whole lot of things ultimately coronal heating problem appears to be connected to the magnetic field of the sun so it's very important to understand the, the magnetic field magnetic field in turn is produced by the turbulent motions convection is the turbulence there so unless we know convection better we don't know how to generate the magnetic field better. but nevertheless you know that the non relativistic limit of maxwell's equation if you take you can write down an evolution equation for magnetic field in terms by the name induction equation okay there is an inductive term then there is a dissipative term now this shows you that in presence of uh, dissipation the motions could in principle support magnetic field they could lead to the growth of magnetic field okay if these uh, turbulent motions have certain properties and symmetries okay electric part of the force is neglected uh please look up why of course the plasma is highly conducting plasma so if you have any charge separation and electric field as a result uh these will be shorted out because high conductivity means the uh, charge separations are not allowed and the electric field is shorted out but magnetic field because the diversity is zero cannot be shorted out so once produced it's always there so that's why it's magnetohydrodynamics <coughs> it's a important point to note that b equal to 0 is a valid solution of induction equation so if you start off with a zero magnetic field you can never produce and evolve because these equations will not evolve so you always require a seed magnetic field fortunately there is enough candidates for the seed magnetic field dynamo is known as the conversion of kinetic energy into magnetic energy without any electric current at inside that means we are not maintaining it by some external sources it's a self sustained dynamo action that powers the magnetic field of the sun all you have to do is because there are due to uh, thermal imbalances and internal physics as i roughly described that the beyond certain radius the s minus opacity of the sun becomes large radiation gets coupled convection motion sets in and then there is a motion this motion has a kinetic energy which you can tap and convert into the magnetic energy in principle okay so that is called a dynamo okay i will skip this how exactly one does a turbulent dynamo theory because there is absolutely no time one lecture is actually uh, i think it's also an experience for me uh, for uh, i think and for us in future that one lecture for solar physics is basically uh, <laughs> it's better not have it actually uh, because uh, yeah it's just too much so there is uh, alpha effect i'm just giving you a keyword so that you can uh, look up in case you are interested which breaks the symmetry of turbulence if there is a cyclonic turbulence just like cyclonic turbulence on the earth there is a positive cyclone and negative cyclone cyclones and anticyclones in the earth surface because of the rotation and stratification 
it's always screw like motion right so it's not mirror symmetry magnetic field is a pseudo vector so it's also not mirror symmetry so in order to generate something which is not mirror symmetry you must break the turbulence the symmetry of the turbulence and that is naturally broken once you have rotation and stratification for example the convection zone of the sun so in the convection zone of the sun which is the outer envelope one expects that there is a alpha effect is finite and that alpha effect can act as a source to produce the magnetic field because this acts like an electromotive force and it's an all self sustained nothing imposed from outside it's a dynamo which is maintaining itself and magnetic field at least in principle you can see that the there can be a growth of magnetic field and that is actually the reason that there is a magnetic field details are not how much is the alpha effect what is the nature of alpha effect it is not a scalar quantity in general it is a tensorial quantity so all these details are missing but roughly we know that the dynamo is working which is giving you the magnetic field but it gives you a diffuse field space filling uh, it's uh, filling the uh, entire sun from there how do we go and make this localized intense magnetic structures that's a uh, challenge that remains okay how do you go from a diffuse magnetic field to forming a very localized bipolar structure is a, a very challenging problem uh, today and uh, at least for me it's an open problem uh, the there are various conserved quantities that one can rely on to constrain the nature of magnetic field what should be the nature of magnetic field if it was produced by uh, an alpha effect can somewhat be uh, determined by uh, the uh, so called invariant of the problem in this case the magnetic helicity which is a, a topological invariant so look up uh, why it is topological invariant okay if you look at uh, if you write down this is a vector potential curl of vector potential is magnetic field quantity defined volume integral of that is known as the magnetic helicity this is a conserved quantity okay if this is a conserved quantity and if at some large length scale global scale you nevertheless detect that it's a positive quantity we must immediately say that we started from uh, something like a zero helicity but in a global scale because on a global uh, scale we observe some sort of a magnetic helicity it must always be compensated by a small scale associated magnetic helicity everything is just opposite in the uh, southern hemisphere so you can focus on the north hemisphere helicity therefore is always giving you a bihelical magnetic field so that positive and negative can cancel each other to produce a net zero you cannot produce a helicity because it's a conserved quantity okay? it's a topological invariant of ideal energy okay so one of the prediction is that this is bihelical in a somewhat recent work we have actually even shown so let's just look at this and that's the guidance here so this is from a data we have basically shown that uh, red is positive blue is negative and solar data actually supports that the field is a function of scale okay so this is large length scale this is small length scale at large length scale this is positive at small length scale it's negative exactly as you would expect if the dynamo was produced by alpha effect or the magnetic field was produced from an alpha but the open problem is this is giving you a diffuse field how do you form a sense spot so make sure that uh, you ask questions when somebody uh, tells you that alpha effect has given uh, you are a magnetic field that is not enough you have to that's one step but it's not enough to produce a sunspot convection it's a very complicated uh, feature after all whenever we are talking about flow here what is this flow this flow is exactly the convection when we are talking about uh, differential rotation what is this flow here after all we are plotting some sort of a, a, a velocity field yeah, in some sense that is also uh, convection because this layer is convectively unstable okay. so ultimately we should know the nature of convection i will uh, perhaps not have any time now because it's more than 11 that the convecting granules that you see at the surface the granule size gets bigger and bigger as you go deeper down okay so uh, it's very complex uh, spectrum i hope you know a bit about the uh, Uh, Schwarzschild criterion that if there is an outward negative gradient of entropy in any system, yeah, if this such gradient of uh, specific entropy is a function of height, where the gravity is pointing downward, yeah, suppose that convection, and if this gradient is zero, 
less than zero, negative, then you will always have convection motion. So that is enough to tell about convection. That's a formula for a mixing length, which basically tells you that the convection is transported most efficiently by largest scales that are excited. Largest scales correspond, there is a single scale in the mixing length theory. Largest scales are the largest scale height in the problem. Now, if you haven't yet seen, then you look up the scale height. The scale height is a function of radius for the sun. Largest scale height are at the bottom of the convection zone, very close to the, uh, uh, yeah, near the bottom of the convection zone. Those are the scales that are excited with largest velocity amplitude, convective flux, which is carrying the heat flux that is generated from nuclear burning in outer layer is carried by this convective flux. Okay. The largest velocity will carry the largest flux. So basically what one imagines is that if you plot a spectrum, this will peak at the large length scale and convective flow is basically dominated by large scales. This is the observation modern observation where it turns out this is the large length scale, this is a small length scale. These are the predictions of simulations and theory. And the current observational limit is two orders of magnitude smaller for the flow of the convective motions. So the large scale convective motions as observed in modern times is actually much smaller, two orders of magnitude smaller than what you would expect from standard theories. Let's just put it as standard theories. So bottom line, we do not know what convection is. Okay. We do not know how convection is transport, how exactly the convection is there, of course, that we observe, but how exactly it is transporting the convective flux or yeah, the energy, that is the detail is not known. Given that that is not known, it is convection that is driving the modes, oscillation modes of the star, the sun. It is the convection that is also driving the differential rotation. It is the convection that is also driving the magnetic field. So with this missing link, I could very safely say that we don't know any of this. And by that I mean the details of any of this. We roughly know, but not the details. Okay. So I think I'll stop here because then helioseismology is, uh, is a whole new topic. The only way we can actually see below the surface because sun is basically opaque at the photosphere and we can't really see anything below the surface. But just like you do this uh, so-called, I think I might have had this tuning fork experiment. I don't know if nowadays this is done, but in uh, our time, uh, we used to, we were asked to measure the speed of sound in air by actually having resonances with the tuning fork. Yeah? And so that means by simply looking at the frequency and oscillations, you can actually measure the properties of the system, like the sound speed of the uh, medium here in the room. Okay? These are the organ pipes. These are musical instruments. Sun, you can imagine, is just like a musical instrument and that is oscillating, vibrating at its fundamental frequencies, looking at which we can actually infer the background stratification, sound speed, temperature, all that from the technique known as the helioseismology. Okay. So I will not get into that and uh, we'll stop here. I hope I have given you a, a broad overview of various things that are involved in solar physics. There is a question, how do I... Uh, Maybe I should, uh, yes. There is a raise hand, how, what do you do? Okay, yeah. Is there somebody, uh, Santosh or somebody, uh, how can I unmute the person? Hi. Yes. Unmute, uh, I'm not able to unmute the person. In more, right? I mean, ah, okay. Hello, so, sir. hello? Yes, sir. So, yeah. I have a doubt regarding uh, coronal loops. So, uh, sir, is the coronal loops are exactly same as the solar flares? No, no, no. Coronal loops uh, can give rise to solar flares. Solar flares are basically more like uh, that are uh, the uh, it's like you can see that there are loop-like structures which can reconnect and a large energy can actually be ejected 
outward towards the uh, interplanetary space. So that is a flare. Flare means something is going away from the sun. Loops can be actually bound to the sun itself. Flare is uh, like now an open system. Okay, sir. But they are connected. That you are right, that they are connected. The flares, the coronal loops could induce flares. Yeah, Mahender Aruri, yes? Yes, sir. Uh, hello, sir. Yes? Sir, uh, why the granule size increases uh, with the depth, sir? Yeah, so that is to do with the mass conservation because the density is uh, 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 increasing as you are going uh, downward depth. or you could... Uh, so, it's basically if you apply the mass conservation, I think I've even uh, given you the formula. So, uh, did I... Uh, did you, Because the scale height and density, they are both increasing with height. So typically what happens is that the granule have a size, the vertical size of the order of the scale height. Okay. Now the scale height is increasing with height. And if I, my vertical dimension increases, just very naively a hand waving argument, that if my vertical dimension of a granule increases, you would expect that even the horizontal extent, simply the mass conservation will also increase. So it is simply to do with the fact that the density is increasing, density pressure, everything is increasing as you go deeper down. Scale heights are also increasing as you go deeper down. Okay. So the extent of the granules is also increasing because that's the only scale at which the convection is excited. So one cell is much larger as you go deep down because the scale height is much large. So that is the main reason. Sir, one more question, sir. Yeah. Sir, how do we calculate the, the rotation rate of the sun uh, by using the uh, uh, image of the sun? Well, not by directly uh, looking at the image, but there are helioseismology techniques because the rotation, just like the magnetic field, there are it induces splittings in the frequency spectrum of the oscillation frequency. So, if uh, a body is static, not rotating, you will expect a certain frequency of mode of oscillation. Sir, I mean... Uh, the speed of the sun sunspot, sir, day by day, likewise. Speed of the sunspot, uh, if you have uh, uh, continuous imaging of the sun, yes, sir. Are called uh, field line tracking. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So suppose could... suppose there is a, a solar dynamic observatory, observatory uh, uh, images are there. Yes. Uh, HMI like that. Yeah. HMI continuum. So, based on that image, how do we calculate the, the speed of the sun uh, uh, throughout the uh, rotation of a particular sun, sunspot? You can, uh, I mean, you can just uh, differentially, I mean, that may not be the most accurate way of measuring the differential rotation. That is not the accurate way of measuring the differential rotation. You are only, by looking at the sunspot at the surface, you are only looking at the surface. They have an uh, internal structure as well. And the idea for the, in these papers, like based on helioseismology, you can actually probe the rotation profile also the deeper layers. But what you are saying is that if I suppose track this sunspot, I observe a sunspot, I simply track the sunspot at say latitude of plus 10 degree, and I track the another sunspot at latitude of say plus 20 degree. Right. So it's just basically like a, a tracking of the sunspot. And then uh, that will give you a sense of shear. But uh, day by day, how much uh, it uh, uh, transfer uh, uh, distance uh, like that? Oh, but, uh, sunspot... Suppose same time, uh, uh, suppose uh, today uh, we have taken the uh, uh, image of uh, 1030. Just tomorrow also is, uh, taking like that. If we take uh, uh, one... You may need, uh, for more accurate measurement, you may require uh, measurements at a finer time interval. So, HMI is giving you data at every 45 seconds. So, why you want to wait one day? So, you can take data at every uh, 45 seconds and you can try to track the granulation. So, that's also a method known as granulation tracking and stuff. Okay. okay. Thank so, you. Sir. Every 45 minutes. Every 45 seconds. Seconds. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Because okay. sun is oscillating over five minute time scale. So you might have heard the five minute oscillation of the sun. So in order to detect, you must have enough data point within five minutes. So solar cadence, it's called cadence. The yeah, yeah. And the time resolution. So that is very high nowadays. So it's 45 seconds. 45 seconds. So every 45 seconds, we have to take the one image. Then uh, we have to collect. 
yeah you can try but that is not as i'm saying uh, it's not the most accurate way of measuring the differential rotation there are many other better techniques um, for uh, a msc project like that sir i'm asking yeah yeah no that yeah, one sure okay okay, okay. Right. thank you sir thank you. so is there akshat uh, yes uh, sir Uh, should i go to the presentation more so akshat was asking some question ah uh, yes sir sir can you hear me yeah uh, sir if the sun is entirely made of gas and uh, plasma then why does it appear to have a uh, to have a sharp edge in the images like it's not a solid object right it's not a solid object but uh, yeah it's actually also a good question but yeah it's a sharp object because of its finite radius because it's like uh, still a bound object which has a finite uh, temperature only at that temp only at that uh, what you say uh, radius as i uh, showed uh, the sun uh, has acquired this radius as a result of hydrostatic equilibrium so radius is fixed fixed because of its hydrostatic equilibrium process now once you fix the radius and luminosity the its surface temperature is fixed now surface temperature is fixed only at this surface at this radius right so that gives you the light equivalent of the temperature of that particular surface which is a black body radiation so that is going to look like a sharp object here yeah but it is not very sharp also and the radius also changes and then one uh, goes to uh, measuring the surface gravity oscillations to actually finally further uh, constraining the uh, radius of the uh, okay sir thank you yeah but i, I hope i have uh, clarified it I'm, yes sir uh, yes sir yeah. there is uh, tanmoy sir uh, sir uh, from the variation of solar flux uh, although the um, the parameters which are uh, which are governed to uh the solar flux they are random but the variation of solar flux is why so periodic sorry uh yes. sir why the variation of solar flux is so periodic because the, the controlling parameters are random um uh, you mean the uh, solar irradiance that was yeah yeah because this is related to the magnetic cycle magnetic cycle is not at all random magnetic cycle is very perfectly 11 year cycle actually now why it is a perfectly linear cycle is a question of dynamo because these are dynamo modes and these modes come with a dispersion relation because these are also like modes of the unstable magnetic fields so there the dispersion relation comes with a frequency and growth rate and stuff so the growth so frequency is determined by the by basically the dynamo process and this irradiance seems to be tightly cover uh, uh, correlated with the magnetic field and that is also not very hard to imagine because the uh, if you have more magnetic field in the sun you expect more and more reconnection type event to take place to heat up the sun so the sun's temperature locally is also expected to rise after all coronal heating is there also somehow that has also to be tied up here but you can expect some regular variations in temperature of the sun also and whatever number we typically write is only a very small number is only a very representative number so once uh, magnetic field is large more uh, dissipation and more temperature so one may expect uh, naively that the uh, irradiance must also increase okay yeah i think that was a nice question uh, about uh, this uh, why the edges look very sharp they don't perhaps in the data but more towards the uh, and uh, more towards for example the in the sir morning and uh, evening they look uh, sharper yeah yeah sir uh, can you repeat again sir hello yeah i was just talking again about this uh, why the images of the sun look uh, very sharp yeah i mean in the day time uh, the the boundaries you can't really make out because of course uh, it's very hard to really pinpoint the radius of the sun 
actually you can see uh, many papers on the radius of the sun very much. So it's, uh, it's not very straightforward here. Okay. Okay, so I think I have exceeded uh, quite a bit and uh, wish you all good luck uh, reading uh, very many of these other papers that I have uh, mentioned. So thanks. I think I will leave. Thanks.